Hi, welcome to the Fit and Healthy Today show. Uh, today our topic is going to be on epilepsy seizures. A good friend of mine was just um, diagnosed with a seizure disorder and I thought, as you know, whenever I start seeing things come in front of my face, that's what I lecture on for the week. So um, I wanted to go over what these are, uh, what epilepsy is, what seizures are, the facts, uh, causes, triggers, diet, and supplements that have clinical data and studies on them that decrease seizures or epilep epileptic seizures. Now, not everybody that has seizures has epilepsy, but in the United States, about two million people have epilepsy, and they estimate probably about between three and a half to four million people have seizures, a lot of which are not diagnosed. People just kind of black out a little bit or kind of go into la-la land and they don't know quite what happens. They get tired for a few days and they come back out of it. Um, I've written on here or typed out the actual um, definition, but mainly what it is is we've got, we have a short circuit in the brain pretty much is what happens. Uh, a misfiring in the brain where the neurons aren't properly communicating with each other and different responses uh, can occur. And, and I decided not to go into a whole lot of detail because there are so many different responses down to violent shaking, twitching, uh, frozen, eyes freezing, you know, numbness. There's so many different things uh, as far as seizures and epileptic responses can be. Um, if, you're for, if you want to research that further, um, you can, but if you have epilepsy, you already know what your specific ones are. Um, 30 different kinds of seizures. So not just epileptic, but 30 different kinds that we now have a name for uh, in the world. So if you have a seizure disorder, I know my good friend has had these same symptoms for over 40 years. She got in a bad car accident, broke a collarbone when she was a, a baby, and never had gotten diagnosed. And she had off and on always had these issues, and she has a thick file, but never got diagnosed. So um, we had a good doctor in town by the name of Dr. Lindbergh that just diagnosed her. So interesting. Um, when we're talking about causes and triggers, look at I almost have a whole page full of causes and triggers for epileptic seizures or for seizures themselves. Oh, man. And most of these have to do, I would say, primarily with lifestyle changes that have occurred in the United States. Um, the heavier usage of medications and drug usage, uh, particularly among uh, the age 40 and below, a uh, lot higher usage of psychotropic drugs in the brain, both legal and illegal. A higher usage of pain medications. Uh, certain drugs that are meant to be anti-seizure medications given to people to treat other ailments. So we're seeing a lot more um, seizures or seizure-related disorders related to this drug usage. Uh, lack of um, exercise. Just sitting there like slugs, you get no communication uh, with the body, no circulation. Because some of the seizures that people have can be caused by blood vessels singeing uh, in the brain. And so when you don't have good circulation going to the brain and to the rest of the body, uh, it can seize up on you. Um, brain disorders such as strokes, brain tumors, which have risen tremendously since aspartame. And I'll talk about a study a little later on about that. Um, which actually can increase seizures as well. Um, arteriosclerosis, viral infections, the lack of oxygen, which oftentimes strokes cause, but also the lack of exercise and a very acidic sugar diet makes you very um, high CO2 and lack of oxygen. It's kind of funny when I get these medical reports oftentimes, most of the time the doctors are running the CO2 output on there and I have to say probably over half the time I see people in the higher range of CO2 which is carbon dioxide. They're not oxygenating nor are they getting rid of their CO2 levels out of their blood which can uh, contribute to seizures. And then uh, spasms of blood vessels. Now other issues uh, besides just singeing of a blood vessel or the lack of flexibility. Smoking, for example, can harden the arteries and, and cause spasms. A lack of magnesium. And the National Institute of Health estimates that 92% of Americans are magnesium deficient, which can contribute to these kinds of spasms as well. Um, diabetes. Um, eating away the vascular system can increase those blood vessel spasms. 
High levels of aluminum or heavy metals. So if you work in the paint industry or have for a long period of time and you've had a lot of aluminum, lead, or heavy metal exposure, uh, or you got, like me, I've only got one left, but you have mercury amalgam fillings, that can contribute to seizures, no matter how much the Dental Association wants to deny it. Heavy metals can cause seizures and seizure disorders. They cause neurological problems in the brain. Look at the lead exposures we had with lead paint, with kids eating paint, just minor amounts, and the retardation it would do to keep them from growing in their brain. So heavy metal exposure. Anybody who has seizures, the doctor should contemplate, particularly if they've been in those industries or in older housing, should contemplate doing some heavy metal testing. Uh, an Arizona State University study about aspartame found a direct correlation between aspartame and seizures. And the industry kind of went, shh, everybody be quiet. And I know for me, when I was using a, a product called Crystal Light that was full of aspartame at the time, I couldn't see at night. I literally couldn't drive at night. And remember, the sight portion is, is back here. So when aspartame gets above a certain temperature, which our body temperatures tend to run above 98.2 at least, um, 98.5 or 6 being the average, it converts to formaldehyde in the brain. So uh, aspartame chemicals, MSG can be a trigger uh, for that. I know with me, MSG gives me a massive headache. So avoiding that MSG or chemicals. Remember, we have over 3,000 different chemicals they add in our foods, whereas they have one one hundredth of that in Europe that they allow added to foods. So these chemical additives can contribute to seizures as well. Nutritional deficiencies, and, and I really think this is a very large portion um, because the diets and the way our food is um, processed and the way it's actually grown, it's lacking in minerals substantially. People are eating tons of sugar, which cause their B, B vitamins to decrease, and we've got problems with no trace minerals. We're all drinking the super high purified distilled kind of water. We're gonna, we lose out our trace minerals. And the foods we're eating no longer have the trace minerals because they're spraying everything with like miracle Grow types of products. And bottom line is they don't have the 72 trace minerals and the main minerals that our bodies need that we used to get in our fruits and vegetables. We wouldn't be having this conversation 100 years ago. Um, taurine deficiency. Now, certain things can cause taurine deficiencies, but taurine is an amino acid that, and when you're B6 deficient, you cannot utilize taurine. So a deficiency in taurine in the brain can cause that as well too, or it can cause actually extreme anxiety as well too, but it can lend itself to seizure disorders. Allergies and hereditary. So those people who have obviously communication problems in their brain as far as heredity is concerned, obviously, if you've got someone who has epilepsy in your family, like my aunt on my mother's side has epilepsy. So it's something that is, we were always mindful and aware of that potentially it could be within our genetic chain. So knowing your genetics is helpful in that regard as well. Allergies and allergy medications, um, obviously because they cause you to become extremely inflamed, which allows the vascular system to, uh, system to singe and spasm. Glandular imbalances in the pituitary and the thyroid. You know, there's a lot of testing when people are diagnosed with seizures that physicians need to be conducting. And I know standard physicians or um, uh, uh, neurologists will tend to just do, you know, the MRIs or they'll do the um, uh, brain scans, that type of thing. But they really also need to look at doing some of these additional testings because diagnosing it is one thing, yes. Getting to the bottom of what's causing it is actually truly what we want to do. I know that some of this all added up can be costly, but doing heavy metal, um, nutritional vitamin analysis, checking these types of things are very, very, very important. Checking thyroid hormones, doing a complete thyroid panel. Important to get to the actual cause of the seizures. Hypoglycemia. Um, now, blood sugars or extreme emotional stress can trigger these brain shutoffs or these brain short circuits. Um, because biochemically, our body changes when we're under a lot of stress, releasing lots of adrenaline and cortisol and our you know, fluctuations become very acidic. And those emotional triggers can trigger seizures or epilepsy as well too. It's kind of funny, there was some additional research and there's not much discussion about this in most of the medical texts 
about digestion in coordination. And more and more scientists are starting to believe that this is our second brain. And there was some research done uh, a, a while back, back in the 50s and 60s, having to do with certain areas uh, in the digestive tract that when they were removed or they were cut off or, or anything involving particular problems in those areas, that people would end up with neurological problems. So, and it could be maybe perhaps because of the absorption of certain nutrients like B12 and other things, B6, that feed the neurological. But there seems to be something related People who tend to have epilepsy and seizures tend to have a lot of gastrointestinal problems. And so that can kind of cue you in that maybe that may need to look, be looked at as well. Lots of causes, lots of triggers. Um, and there's more. I didn't list them all. So, But I wanted to get to the bottom line so that you can kind of recognize if you have someone close to you that has these, to recognize that you need to reduce these types of triggers. Now, when we're talking about people who have epilepsy and seizures, there's certain kind of foods that you shouldn't eat and certain foods that you should eat, and most of which here in the United States we don't eat. Um, the, most of the research that I found um, utilized a ketogenic diet, and that is kind of like a modified Atkins diet, bottom line. I know the press and everybody else was very anti-Atkins diet, but I'm talking about an Atkins diet that doesn't involve a lot of heavy red meat, okay? Because remember, um, meat fats can be inflammatory by nature and actually can raise the risk, believe it or not, saturated fats and trans fats of having seizures and epilepsy. So you actually almost have to do the diet that I do, and actually that my husband does, which is better quality plant source proteins, okay? Cultured types of proteins. We don't want straight milk coming out, but if you're eating a raw, raw milk or raw types of cheeses were found not to contribute to epileptic seizures or to seizures themselves whereas certain milk products were found to contribute. And we don't know exactly the direct link on here, maybe because they're not as easy on the digestive tract. Um, so, but mostly plant sources. So you're talking about your beans, your raw milks and cheeses, your um, soy products, those plant source proteins, and then your fish, of course. You can do that. That has a, uh, what are called good fats, essential fatty acids, that reduce inflammation. So sticking mostly with that as far as your protein is concerned. Now, you've got to kind of watch peanuts, but the other nuts, as long as you're not allergic to them, are very beneficial in reducing inflammation and helping the brain better communicate um, between the neurons. You know, you've got to receive and send and move all this information around in the brain at a, the speed of light. And so your brain handles things very, 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 very quick. And so you have to be able to have the adequate amounts of good foods and nutrients in order for that communication to properly take place. Eating lots of greens. Now, I only found one particular herb that I warn people about if they tend to have seizures or epilepsy, and that's sage. Don't eat it. A lot of people will do sage in their spices, in their cooking, uh, or it actually sage is also taken for heavy perspiration, people that have perspiration disorders. But avoid sage if you have any type of uh, uh, seizure or epileptic, or if you suspect you might. Um, I listed the supplements that I know have studies that back them up, as usual. I always try to do that because uh, when the professionals come back and they say, I'm not going to back that up, it's not the truth. Because the, uh, these all have double-blind placebo studies that support that these help lower the incidence of seizures and epilepsy. And some of it pretty dramatically. So besides focusing on the diet, which I think is always going to be the number one thing to do, Diet, diet, diet. And organics when you can, because remember, there's tons of chemicals being sprayed all over your food. And you're eating that, and that goes in your body, and it causes neurological issues. It causes neurological issues in the bugs. What do we think it does to us humans? A good multiple vitamin, number one, because the food ain't the way it used to be. You've got to have a good multiple vitamin with your basic nutrients, your A, B, C, all of that kind of stuff in there, and your minerals, okay? Number one, that's the core to go along with this. Number two, B-complex. And B-complex is given two to three times per day, actually is an anticonvulsant. And you think, a simple B-complex? Yes, found to be as effective as some of the drugs that are out there, and I won't mention them, that are being handed out and 
being told that there's very few side effects. That isn't the case either. So if you are recommended these certain types of classifications of drugs used for seizures, research them and look up the side effects. And, and if you do experience any of those, um, be very mindful to let your doctor know about that. Some of, the, some of those reactions to medications can be deadly on some of these seizure medications. I was researching it for my friend. And uh, there's one drug that can cause, if you get a rash all over your body, severe, it could actually kill you. And so it, you can anaphylactically react to these drugs pretty heavily. They have a higher incident rate of anywhere from 1 to 5%. So you have to be aware that that's out there as well. Um, natural vitamin E can reduce seizures by 50%. Natural. Not the kind you get in your regular grocery store or drug store. A natural vitamin E. 50%. If you were a neurologist, don't you think you should be recommending that? I do. I do. Magnesium citrate is an anti-convulsant in combination with B6. It helps with taurine uptake to the brain. Remember, magnesium is also a vasorelaxer. It prevents some of those spasms that go on in the blood vessels themselves. Calcium citrate, in combination with magnesium, is a sedative. You know how the calcium is very calming. There's calcium lactates, which are also milk calciums, which are very calming to the body. And in combination with magnesium, they're very um, sed sedating. Um, folic acid, and a lot of people particularly that are on these anticonvulsant medications, um, it stops or, or limits the utilization of folic acid. Being aware of that, contemplate supplementation or a good multiple that has a, extra folic acid. Trace minerals, if you're drinking purified water, start adding some trace minerals to your water. Absolutely paramount in order to maintain proper electrical connection. Ester C maintains vascular health. Vitamin A deficiencies. Vitamin A, you don't think of it in terms of protecting the brain, but it's extremely protective of the brain. And here in the United States, we have a lot of kids that are vitamin A deficient. Ralph has discussed that before on, on the studies he's listed. So if you're looking here, most of the items I'm pointing out here are all nutrients and nutrient deficiencies no longer found in our food and no longer available or um, readily in our food anyway. We almost have to supplement with them. Taurine on an empty stomach, the amino acid we talked about. Dimethylglycine, the oxygenation of tissues. Oxygenating, oxygen, oxygen. And so when I see those CO2 levels, I always tell people, you need to bring your oxygen levels up. Let's eat more greens, vitamin E. There are lots of supplements out there uh, that you can do, and exercise, of course, novel idea, also raises your op oxygen uptake. L-carnitine. Um, once again, is depleted by anticonvulsant drugs. So when you're depleting L-carnitine, now L-carnitine is very important for energy in the cells themselves, to the brain and to the heart and to every living cell you have in your body. So if you're carnitine deficient caused by these anticonvulsant drugs, you're not going to feel so good. And as a matter of fact, I wonder if that wouldn't cause somebody to convulse more. So being aware, that's something else you need to add to your uh, little list if you're on those anticonvulsant drugs. CoQ10 aids the oxygenation. Um, CoQ10 for so many different things as far as anti-aging, but oxygenation, once again, when you're talking about um, people who have seizures, we need good oxygenation going into the body. Um, very few times do I see people who are uh, that tend to have seizures that are very physically active. It's not as common. Um, and very rarely do I talk about herbs too much, but these herbs just came out like lightning bolt fire. And there's a doctor by the name of Dr. Christopher uh, that did quite a bit of research on these particular herbs for the nervous system and the central nervous system. And they're very helpful, helpful as anticonvulsants and getting the body to where Huh, it just, um, how do you, uh, modulates in its nervous system. I know black coash and some of these other things are used for other things. But for some reason, this combination of herbs, or one, and what they basically recommended was you rotate them, can be very helpful in supporting the anticonvulsant. Um, most of the time, the doctors don't have much information about this type of supplementation. So I would do a lot of research on myself, and then maybe if you'd like, uh, if you'd like a copy, um, you can come by the store, uh, any of the vitamin herb stores, and I'll give you a copy of this so that you can maybe discuss it with your doctor and do further research for yourself. 
Um, I took quite a bit of time. Um, we're going to be moving on directly to the research portion of our show. I thought this was important enough to address the specifics. Thank you very much. Welcome to the research portion of our show, and with us today with some good information is Ralph Turciano. Ralph? Thank you for that intro. Welcome. Well, with the advent of diabetes and the fact that a lot of people have it in the next probably five to ten years, most people will have it, it's time to look at a few supplements that may actually help prevent it. Ironically, one that's been demonized quite often that seems to have a positive effect in stopping it is coffee. As released in the bi-weekly Journal of Agricultural and Food Chemistry, the scientists said the past studies have suggested that the regular coffee drinking may reduce the risk of type 2 diabetes. They discovered that coffee consumption prevented the development of high blood sugar and also improved insulin sensitivity in animals, thereby reducing the risks of diabetes. Coffee also caused a cascade of other beneficial changes in the fatty liver and inflammatory adiposotokins related to reduced diabetes risk. Now keep in mind when they're talking coffee, they are talking straight coffee. Not coffee with ice cream in it, not coffee with tons of sugar and cream in it, just basically your black straight coffee. So if something that the diabetes is a concern, it may ironically be something to consider. After that, those of you with diabetes that have type 2 body diabetes, I should say, that are tough to control. Well, in the Endocrine Society's 92nd Annual Meeting in San Diego, they came up, or I should say discovered, something very interesting about diabetics that have tough-to-control diabetes. 91% of type 2 diabetics that have problems controlling the blood sugar are deficient in vitamin D, an amazingly high number. But they discovered an inverse relationship between vitamin D intake and the ability to control blood sugars itself. And again, this was from the Endocrine Society's 92nd annual meeting. They said, quote unquote, despite receiving regular primary care visits before referral to the endocrine clinics, 91% of the patients either had a vitamin D deficiency or insufficiency. So some of you diabetics out there may want to consider in regards to vitamin D, as opposed to a host of a whole other ailments. Now, as we come towards allergy season, there is an interesting thing you may want to consider, and it comes back down to pine bark once again. And this was in the Phytotherapy Research Journal on June 14th. They conducted a study, and the study was approved by the Ethical Committee as well as Health Canada authorities. They, discussed, they did a study on pycnogenol itself. They gave one 50 milligram pycnogenol tablet and or one placebo twice a day. Again, it was only a 50 milligram pycnogenol tablet or a placebo twice a day. What they discovered was this, and then they exposed them, I should take that back, then they exposed them to an allergen called birch pollen. They noticed that the immunoglobulin E, or some of the compounds I should say that rise in response to allergens, basically were 31.9% higher in the placebo group and only 19.4% higher in the pycnogenol group after exposure to the allergen. But what is more impressive, and I want to go this quote unquote, as detailed analysis showed, pycnogenol was more effective the earlier patients began taking the product prior to exposure to the birch pollen. The researchers speculate that a lag time of at least five weeks prior to pollen exposure is required for pycnogenol to defy hay fever symptoms. Subjects taking pycnogenol for seven weeks before the onset of the birch season required very little non-prescription antihistamine. Only 12.5% of them required it compared to the placebo group where 50% required non-prescription drug antihistamines pretty strong and powerful reduction in those allergy symptoms from something simple. But again, the earlier you take it, the better. All right, now we go to cancer, prostate cancer, and basically a slew of other cancers. Comes back down to polyphenols and red wine and green tea. And they put the title on the article, not I, 
say halt prostate cancer growth. And this was from the Federation of American Societies of Experimental Biology. They said in what could lead to a major advance in treatment of prostate cancer. Scientists know exactly now why polyphenols in red wine and green tea inhibit the cancer growth. To get a little technical, they said it blocks what's called SPHK-1 slash SB1 based signaling pathways, which play a role in prostate cancer. But it also plays a role in other cancers such as colon, breast, and gastric cancers. So something to think about regards to polyphenols from red wine and again, green tea. They also said when they took the human cancer cells and they implanted them in animals, the results showed, in their words, a dramatic decrease in tumor size. And the mice drinking either the green tea or the red wine. They said, quote unquote, the profound impact that the antioxidants in red wine and green tea have on our bodies is more than anyone could have imagined 25 years ago. Wiseman added, who's the researcher. As long as they are taken in moderation, all show signs show that red wine and green tea may be ranked among the most potent health foods we know. A very good study for the, Ameri the Federation of American Societies of Experimental Biology, just released recently. And now, how would you like to be able to decrease your lung cancer risk by 50%? Even so, maybe 66% if you are a smoker or a non-smoker. Well, as they quote, as the, I should say, the June 16th issue of the Journal of American Medical Association, or JAMA, they said, quote unquote, that higher levels of B6 common amino acids associated with lower risk of lung cancer. They said previous deficiencies in B vitamins had shown to increase the probability of DNA or subsequent gene mutations. They also added that deficiencies in B vitamins have been shown to be high in many Western populations. So what they looked at was over 400,000 people. And I should say close to 400,000 blood samples. And they said, to disease and onset are associated with reduction of at least 50% on the risk of developing lung cancer. Just regards to your B6 levels, the ones with the highest levels of B6 had a 50% reduction in lung cancer. In addition to this, when they added the amino acid L-methionine, it reduced their chance of lung cancer down by 66%. Pretty amazing cancer reduction risk from some two very simple, inexpensive supplements. Well, I'll leave it at that since we're running short on time, and thank you. Thank you very much, Ralph. We appreciate it. Thank you again for joining our show, Research for Yourself. Thanks again.